Okay, this is a screencast on Paradise Lost Book 9, um, although this screencast will uh, kind of covers more than that because it's more conceptual. Um, it is about the fall and Milton's theodicy. Um, and much of the material for this screencast is taken from an essay by Daniel Danielson. Um, so uh, you can use this material for the other readings aspect of the um, assessment objectives in the exam. Um, okay, Paradise Lost and Theodicy. The word theodicy means uh, the justification of God, especially in the light of the presumed existence of evil. The problem being, of course, uh, that as um, many people who are opposed to the, the, the notion of God, I suppose you might say, um, argue that if God, um, if God is just, then you cannot allow the existence of evil. If he's not just, he cannot be God. And therefore there can be no God because we know evil exists, depending on how you define evil, I suppose, of course. So, um, so theodicy is, is the way in which um, the, the, um, people interested in theology and uh, religious people generally, I suppose, um, justify God, especially in the light of the existence of evil. Um, and as such, Paradise Lost is clearly a theodicy given at the start of book one explicitly states that it is um, intended to justify the ways of God to man. Um, so Milton is setting out in Paradise Lost to defend God, to defend God's actions and to defend God's justice. Um, and a key component for this uh, is free will for Milton. Um, Milton was in many respects a modern man, he was, he was, this was in the early modern period of course, and um, Milton was a very progressive thinker and free will uh, was of great importance to Milton. Um, and the argument ran um, that human beings and angels, this applies to the rebel angels as well, it applies to Satan, um, human beings and angels have free will and are responsible for their own actions. Um, it seems straightforward, but of course there is always the immediate problem um, in theodicy of any kind, I, I would expect, that this immediately comes into conflict with God's omniscience. Um, however, um, Daniel Danielson argues that for Milton the creation of beings with free will is a self-limitation on God's part, that God has deliberately... Um, placed a kind of a limitation on himself by uh, creating beings with free will. Um, the, the human beings and angels having free will is more important to God than his own omnipotence, I suppose you might say. Um, not that his omnipotence is, is genuinely affected, um, or his omniscience for that matter, um, but, but he chooses a certain kind of self-limitation in that he will not interfere with the free will of human beings and angels. Um, and Milton also argues um, explicitly in the Areopagitica that supposed virtues have no value without free will. So things like um, kindness, um, bravery, um, anything that you can think of as virtuous really, none of that has any meaning unless there is free will. It has no meaning unless it is possible to not do that, those things, to not be virtuous. And he argues that freedom is essential for morality and for reason. And in the Areopagitica, Milton writes, Many there be that complain of divine providence for suffering Adam to transgress foolish tongues. When God gave him reason, he gave him freedom to choose, for reason is but choosing. He had been else a mere artificial Adam, such an Adam as he is in the motions, um, by which he means puppet shows. Uh, we ourselves esteem not of that obedience or love or gift which is of force. So Milton is arguing there that... Um, that if God had not given 
Adam and Eve for that matter, freedom and the, the freedom to choose and the ability to reason, which for Milton are all the same thing. Um, human beings would have just been puppets. And if human beings had just been puppets, then um, all the virtues, obedience, love, um, generosity, I suppose, is what it means by gift. Um, none of those things have any meaning or any genuine virtue uh, if people are forced to um, to perform in that in those ways without freedom, they are meaningless. Um, this is similar to Eve's argument in Book Nine, lines three hundred and thirty-five to three hundred and thirty-six, where she asks of Adam, "And what is faith, love, virtue, unassayed, alone, without exterior help, sustained?" Um, and unassayed here means untried or untested. Um, so she's saying that faith, love, virtues generally are meaningless if they are never tested. If they are too easy, then they are meaningless. Um, which is not exactly the same as Milton's argument in the area of Pagitica, but it is very close. Um, the virtues can't be tested, of course, anyway, if people do not have the free will that would, that would allow them to fail. Um, this fallibility is very important, as we will see a little bit later. Okay, so um, Eve makes a very similar argument in Paradise Lost to Milton's argument in the Areopagitica, um, arguing that it is important that um, it is possible to not be virtuous, um, it's, and important that virtues are tested. Um, and so we come to God's foreknowledge and determinism. Um, God's foreknowledge is, is a big problem in um, theodicy, uh, as I've already mentioned. Um, so God's foreknowledge, which is an aspect of his general omniscience, and the fact that he does nothing, really, to stop the fall. I mean, he sets his angels to try to prevent Satan from entering uh, the Garden of Eden, but uh, beyond that he really does very little to stop the fall of humanity. Um, this can lead to the belief that it is actually God's responsibility, ultimately. The fall is God's responsibility, or even that the fall is God's plan, that he planned for this to happen, that this was deliberate on his part. Um, it can also lead to the assumption that all things are predetermined. Um, so because God knows everything, then there is no other way to act than in the way that we do. And therefore, ultimately, this means that God is responsible and human beings are not. It makes God absolutely responsible and it makes human beings have absolutely no responsibility whatsoever. So anything you do is not your fault. Um, and if everything is predetermined, in fact, there is uh, the whole concept of fault and blame. Uh, is completely meaningless and the whole concept of responsibility is completely meaningless for that matter um, so free will is clearly very important to Milton uh, but there remains the question of whether free will and God's, om God's omniscience can coexist and Milton insists that they can for Milton it's very important that human beings are free and angels are free and it is also very important that God is omniscient that God remains fully God and Milton's answer to this paradox is in God's relationship with time which is very different from ours um, our experience of time our relationship with time is based on the I think the second law of thermodynamics which basically means um, that time only, I mean, it's, it's a complication to this, but, but I won't go into those, but basically time moves in one direction. It moves from past to future, um, and it can't move in any other way, and we are always moving into the future. Inevitably, there is no uh, way of stopping time, slowing time, turning time back. Um, we all always just move into the future, and we can't see the future. Um, we can make predictions based on the past and so forth, but we can never really know the future. However, in book three, God writes that God looks down from heaven, beholding from his prospect high, wherein past, present and future he beholds. Um, 
This basically means that God sees time differently to us. God sees time all at once. He sees the past, present and future all together and he sees it as though the future has already occurred or perhaps um, another slightly different interpretation perhaps is that he sees the future as if it is currently happening. But either way, he sees it as something that is certain and cannot be changed, uh, not, not because everything is predetermined, but because that's how he sees it. He, do, he is not subject to the second law of thermodynamics, and he can see the whole of time altogether. So therefore, free will exists for us, but God sees the outcomes of our actions as always already revealed. Just as we can see, um, or we, we can know what happened in the past, um, and we can't change that uh, because it's already happened, God sees the future in the same way. It's effectively already happened for God because he exists outside of time in the way that we understand it, outside that fourth dimension of time. Okay, so it's important for Milton's theodicy that the fall is not predetermined, that human beings are free, and um, that human beings are responsible, and God is not responsible for the fall. Um, and this is important, of course, um, just to sum up slightly, it's very important that, that human beings are responsible for the fall and God is not. Otherwise, the whole thing becomes meaningless. It just becomes some sort of clockwork plan that God set in motion. And it's all uh, just, it's just all meaningless, basically. For it to have significance, um, for human beings at least, for it to have significance, then we must... Um, have free will. It must be our responsibility. Um, but it's also just as important that humanity were fallible, even though they are supposedly perfect before the fall, if the notion of the fall is to make any sense. Um, so there is a question here somewhere perhaps of what perfect might mean in this case because surely if people are simply perfect then um, they can't make mistakes and if they can't make mistakes they can't fall so they must be able to make mistakes even though in some sense perfect they must be fallible and please ignore that typo on that slide I'm not telling you which one it is you can find it for yourselves okay human fallibility so even though they're supposed to be essentially perfect before the fall, it's important that Adam and Eve are fallible if the fall is to be possible at all. And there are examples of this, that Eve has tendencies to vanity, um, and the very fact that they argue suggests fallibility. Um, I would argue that in the argument Adam and Eve have in Book 9, before the fall, um, they are actually both right. Um, even though they're arguing dif different positions, which seem to be, um, incompatible, they are actually both right in their different ways. Um, but the very fact that they can have an argument and both be right, in, in other words, there are there are complexities of interpretation, and um, that in itself is, gives them the space to make mistakes, it gives them the, st the, the, the space to, to fall, to be fallible. Um, also, to address this question of their perfection, um, I've used the phrase essentially perfect there deliberately because I think there is a sense, I, I think that's where it lies. Their perfection is in their essence, some sense of their essential humanity is perfect. But it is, um, but it is in embryo, if you like, it is an, at an early stage and therefore they can develop. But because they can develop, they can also fall. There is space for movement. I hope that makes sense. Um, uh, which brings us to the concept of the fortunate fall, in a sense. Okay, so human, so the fall occurs. Adam and Eve are fallible; they make mistakes. Clearly, Eve makes a mistake. Um, she gets gets fooled by the serpent or by Satan in the guise of the serpent. She eats the apple. She persuades Adam to eat the apple. Um, or at least he decides to eat the apple out of love for Eve. And they fall. Humanity is cursed until the um, 
the advent of Christ and so on and so forth. Um, and it's the advent of Christ which is important for this concept of the fortunate fall, which is the idea that the fall was ultimately a good thing because it allowed God to bring forth a greater good, specifically the incarnation of the Son as Christ. So the idea is that this, this incredible act of God to give his Son to humanity, to make his Son human, to allow his Son to suffer and die for our sins, and redeem humanity and all that sort of thing is, is itself a greater good than the perfection of humanity in the first place and therefore it's a good thing that the fall happened. However there is no evidence that Milton believed this to be the case, there was no evidence that that, that was his position. And also, um, it also it also assumes I suppose that Adam and Eve were perfect in a very big very strong sense before the fall um, and we've already seen or at least I've already argued using Danielson's arguments that that can't possibly be the case because if they were perfect they couldn't have fallen in the first place but this this notion of the fortunate fall seems to suggest that 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 Adam and Eve were absolutely perfect and therefore had nowhere to go there was no possibility of development of, or growth and those things are good things in themselves as well, and that's another reason why the fall was fortunate, and so on and so forth. But the fallibility, the very fallibility of Adam and Eve, the idea that they are essentially perfect, but there is room for improvement and for falling off from that perfection, suggests um, a potential for improvement beyond their initial state of essential perf perfection and uh, therefore the idea it, the, the kind of anti-fortunate fall idea there is that um, without the fall Adam and Eve would have gone on to improve um, to an extent or humanity would have gone on to improve to such an extent that is perhaps beyond our imagination at the moment and uh, the, the the whole of existence would have been so much more glorious than it is and so forth so even though it's true that the fall produced great goodness through the incarnation and sacrifice of Christ um, it actually still would have been better if we hadn't fallen um, and that uh, and, and that is all dependent, in a sense, on the fallibility and um, and improvability of Adam and Eve. Okay, so I, I hope all that makes sense, and I hope that is helpful. Um, remember, again, that uh, most of those ideas, all of those ideas, really, are taken from uh, an essay by Daniel Danielson. So, if you make reference to him in your in the exam. Um, if you're talking about these things, then uh, you, can, you should be able to pick up marks for other readings. Um, good luck, and uh, thank you for listening.